It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the movies of July 31st, 1992. we got five movies to look at today, so let's go ahead and jump right on into it. Let's start off with the first movie that we have, the biggest new release of the weekend, and that was Robert Zemeckis' follow-up to the Back to the Future trilogy, Meryl Streep, Bruce Willis, and Goldie Hawn in the black comedy Death Becomes Her. Some people will go to any length to stay young forever. Is that someone? It's Madeline Ashton. Oh, she was a big star in the 60s. I thought she was dead. Oh, Madeline. You look younger every day. Thank you, Rose. But Madeline Ashton and her old friend, Ellen Sharp. I've lost men to her before. Mad Hill! Are about to go too far. Touch of magic. Drink that potion. And you'll never grow even one day older. Bottoms up. No warning. Now a warning? Siempre viva! Live forever! Ernest, I meant more. They think I'm dead. You are. But you're not. Are you telling me it doesn't hurt when I do this? It doesn't hurt. She's dead! She's dead, Ernest. Now he's dead. I'm dead? Ernest is dead? Everybody's dead! You pushed me down the stairs. I'm so sweaty. I don't think it's sweat, honey. I think you're defrosting. It's a lie. Universal Pictures presents Meryl Street. Bruce Willis. It's a miracle! And Goldie Hawn. Look at me. I'm soaking wet. Death becomes her. I just have to make a telephone call. Okay, first things first. Yes, the visual effects still hold up 30 years later. It's another one of those movies where... You can look at it. This came out in 1992. It's now 2022. And the effects just, like I said, they still hold up all these years later. And this is a pretty good movie overall. It's very flawed. Don't get me wrong. But uh, you got Meryl Streep. You got Bruce Willis. You got Goldie Hawn. They're working off of each other so well. The comedy is very well done. Like I said, the visuals are impressive. There's some great practical effects put in there as well. And... It's an overall really enjoyable movie. I really had a good time with it, watching it again recently. And really, it is just a ton of fun. You've got two great screenwriters here, David Coep and Martin Donovan, who really work up, work this into a very good script that makes for a lot of good funny moments, a lot of good moments of, act, of like, you know, comedy overall. And it really does feel like a Tales from the Crypt episode. Like, you hear the Tales from the Crypt theme song in the trailer there, but... And, of course, Robert Zemeckis produced Tales from the Crypt and actually directed some episodes. But it really does feel like something that you would see from a Tales from the Crypt episode. only thing you're missing is the Crypt Keeper. But, yeah, it feels like that type of a movie. But it's a very funny movie overall. The cast in here just works so well. The music by Alan Svestri is great. The visuals are still very impressive. And, so, I mean, it's still a movie that holds up many years later. It's a movie that's just so funny to watch. And... Just the ways that they create this black humor, this dark comedy all around, and just for how crazy they can go sometimes. It's just a ton of fun to watch on so many levels. It's a movie that really has grown on me in the years, over the years, and really it's become one of the best, one of Robert Zemeckis' more underrated films that he's made because it did not get a good reception at the time it came out, but it did very well at the box office. But uh, over time, it has grown to have this following, and I'm glad to see that more people are enjoying it just as much as I am. So, that's my thoughts on Death Becomes Her. Terrific film. If you haven't seen it, by all means, please check it out. So, uh, with that said, let's go ahead and move on to the next movie that we have here, which is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Not the Buffy the Vampire Slayer that you may be familiar with, but, um, okay, sort of, but we'll get to it once I show you the trailer. I just met this girl named Buffy. I'm Pike. Pike isn't a name. It's a fish. I liked her, even though she seemed kind of flaky. But, as it turns out... You have been chosen, Buffy. To do what? To stop the vampires. Does 
Elvis talk to you? When things started getting weird around here. Oh, we are having a nightmare. You threw a knife at my head. And you caught it. She was the one person I could really count on. Kill him a lot. Hi. Hi. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? I'm saving your butt. That is a bad guy. Can we go, please? The Slayer is unmasked. Let's finish it. I think this relationship has potential. Hi. How's it going? You're obviously having a bad hair day. If she can just get rid of those other guys in her life. Stab him in the heart! Christy Swanson. I am so sure. Donald Sutherland. Ah! Paul Rubin with Rutger Hauer and Luke Perry. Buffy, you're not like other girls. Yes, I am. Buffy, the vampire slayer. You didn't even break a nail. Directed by Fran Rubel Kazooie. So this is one of those movies that has one of those weird production histories behind it where... It doesn't really get t It's not as crazy as something like Cool World was or Man Trouble or some of these other movies that re were interesting failures. But um, what happened was Josh Wheaton sold this movie to Dolly Parton's production company in 91. Uh, but then Wheaton eventually left the film because he became dissatisfied with the direction the film was going. The executives of 20th Century Fox removed a lot of the jokes that Wheaton had there because he thought the humor would be too abstract for audiences. They disliked the darker elements in the script. They wanted a more lighter comedy. Merrick's suicide in the movie was replaced with him being killed by Lothos. Uh, Lothos, I should say. And Buffy's burning down her high school gym to kill all the vampires or eliminate it altogether. And he just became very frustrated with it. He even got with, in it with uh, Donald Sutherland, who described it, we in as entitled... Described, I think he described Donald Sutherland as entitled to work with, difficult to work with, and... He just he just walked off the set, and it's an interesting how that how he was able to come back five years later and do the sh do what he wanted to do with Buffy the Vampire Slayer in the TV series, which eventually became a great show over is in the long run. And most people look at the movie and feel like it's a movie that doesn't work as well, doesn't work as well as it should, compared to the TV series does. But you know, honestly, watching this movie again recently, I didn't think it was that bad. I mean. I could definitely see why Whedon wouldn't, wouldn't have liked what they did with his original script because it is very campy, almost to the point where it almost becomes annoying at times. But overall, it is still pretty fun. You got Christy Swanson playing a great playing the great leading role here in Buffy. In Buffy, and um, Donald Sutherland is can be very good whenever he is, even if it, even if he was sort of entitled on the, behind the scenes. He's still putting a good performance in there. A lot of people are in this are putting good performances in here. Uh, Rutger Hauer is great in this. Uh, Luke Perry's in this movie, and he's doing very well. Um, uh, Paul Rubens looks like he's having the time of his life, and really, I mean, considering wh what was going on at the time when he got caught masturbating in the porn theater, and his career, th many people thought his career was over, it actually turns in a pretty fun, over-the-top, campy role in this, but again, I can kind of see why Wheaton wouldn't have liked this, because this wasn't the movie that he originally wanted to do, but... I mean, for the most part, it's still a fine movie. It's not a classic by any means, and there's been much better comedies like this one before, like this one. But I don't know. From everyone that kept saying that it was a terrible movie, it was something that hasn't held up very well. I tend to disagree. I think it still holds up on its own merits. You can still enjoy the TV series that came after it and still find some enjoyment in this movie as well. But maybe that's just my personal opinion. I know some people who really like the series but don't like the movie. And uh, who knows? Maybe they, maybe it's vice versa. Some people like the movie. Some people don't like the series. It's just it depends on your opinion. Does matter here? But um, yeah, for me personally, I thought the movie was just okay. Like I said, it's no classic by any means necessary, but it doesn't take away from the f fact that we still got a great TV show that was a completely different approach to it. That was kind of what we wanted to do all along. But like I said, I still enjoyed the movie for what it is. If you if you go in there with an open mind, you might find some enjoyment in it as well. So. Uh, with that said, let's go ahead and move on to the next movie that we have here, and that's the animated film, Bebe's Kids. I see you gotta wait from. Can't wait to eat. It started in the mind of an offbeat comedian. We Bebe Kids! We don't die, we! It grew 
into the animated world of Bay Bay's kids. I knew she was trouble. I should have known it when I met her. It was at a funeral. Oh. Who's that girl in that black dress? Whoa. Whoa. She's so fine, make me want to get a job. She told me, she said, if you want to get acquainted with me and my son, you should take us somewhere like Fun World. Fun World. So I go to pick her up the next day. <laughs> Kids with her. Paramount Pictures presents Bay Bay's Kids. Those are double net pants, aren't they? Try to bring it back, huh? Fun It ain't time to go. You're trying to leave us. And for the next 12 hours, they're all Robins. I thought the devil was true when they made Rosemary Banks. But, oh no, oh no. Now we got Baby Kids. It's animation with an attitude. Or in some marketing, they call it this. It's animation just animation apparently in some vi in some trailers for this like yeah i don't get that edit whatsoever but um bay bay's kids uh this is actually done by hyperion studios we've talked about some of their some of their work in the past we recently we talked about rover dangerfield which came out the year before and in a way this is kind of similar to rover dangerfield except that uh robin harris is not playing a dog character here and it's not even him in this particular movie it's um phase on love because i think at the time robin harris had actually died before this movie would actually went into production i could be wrong on that i'd have to double check but i've seen this movie many times before i've seen it so many is i've seen it once a, a lot of times on video i used to watch it all the time on like i said on video and then about 20 years after i fought, watched it for the first time i found a dvd of it at half price books which really at the time I bought it, which was 2017, it was $40 because it was out of print. And luckily I didn't have to pay that much. It was still like 25 bucks, but still, 40 bucks for that. It's impressive that that was that is of how rare that DVD was until, more than likely until recently, when it recently came out on Blu-ray, which really, I think, maybe, maybe lowers that value a little bit. But then again, I think there was also some other DVD versions that came out after it that were cheaper. So, again, I have to look into that, but... Overall, when I watched the movie again, I just thought it was okay. I think it was just a really decent movie overall. The animation is very good. You still, like I said, this is Hyperion Studios. This is the same company that would later go on to do The Proud Family, which this, the director of this, Bruce W. Smith, actually did, as the actually created, and then eventually went on to do the sequel series, Louder and Prouder. These guys are usually great when it comes to animation, and it definitely shows here. Other than that, though, there's nothing really about this that's all that memorable. The voice work is overall okay. I think the story overall is very generic. The comedy isn't really there. There are times when it, it can be legitimately funny. The movie does goes random at some points that make no sense. It's just an okay movie. There's nothing about this movie that's really exciting, to be honest. I'm surprised this movie got made as an animated film because I think it could have easily been made into a live-action feature, and it probably would have been a little bit better, but... For what it is, it's okay. I think, honestly, the short that preceded this, the Itsy Bitsy Spider short, which that of itself became a TV series for USA a year later, I think that's probably the best thing to come out of this thing because you can watch this, you can watch that short on the Blu-ray and the DVD just like you can watch it in the theater and when it was on VHS. So I think that was a much better... I think that was the much better of the two, two that were featured together. Just my personal opinion. But Baby's Kids, for what it is, it's fine. But it isn't one that's going to warrant a whole lot of rewatchability, honestly. So, That's my thoughts on Bay Bay's Kids. Let's go ahead and move on to the next movie that we have here, and that is Enchanted April. Excuse me, we've come about renting the castle of the NFT. Now, here are all the details. It seems so wonderful. It's such a miserable day. Perhaps that's why it seems so wonderful. I've been invited by a friend to spend April in Italy. What? Huh? Just tell you can't go. It's absolutely out of the question. 
So the story here is you've got four women in 1920s England who leave their rainy gray environments to go on holiday in Italy. Uh, two of the ladies um, become acquainted with reading a newspaper advertisement for a small medieval castle off the shores of the Mediterranean. And they find some common ground. Both are, both are struggling to make the best of their unhappy marriages. Having decided to seek other ladies to help see, share experiences, uh, they reluctantly take on the elegant but peevish elderly Mrs. Fisher and the stunning, aloof, and very wealthy Lady Carolyn Dester. Uh, the four women come together at the castle and find rejuvenation in the tranquil beauty, beauty of their surroundings, rediscovering hope and love. I literally read this off of the Wikipedia page because I have never seen this movie, so I really cannot say too much about this movie. Um, it's got a decent cast. Josie Lawrence, uh, Miranda Richardson, Polly Walker, Joan Plowright, Alfred Molina, Jim Broadbent. Pretty good cast overall. The director of this is Mike Newell, who would later go on to direct such movies as Four Weddings and a Funeral. Uh, Donnie Brasco, he would later do Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Oops, excuse me. Yeah, it's some other notable movies, but... Um, uh, this is one that I've never seen before, so I can't really comment on it too much. I know that Plowright got an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actress, and that's pretty much everything I need to I know about this particular movie. So I don't think I don't doubt it's any good, but I, I mean, if I'm seeing a lot of good reviews for it, so I'm not going to say it's not ba bad, but maybe one day I'll check it out. So uh, that's really all I got to say about this one, because like I said, I haven't seen it, so I can't really say too much more about it. That's Enchanted April. Now let's go ahead and move on to the last movie that we have here, and that is The Panama Dispatch. One year ago, the people of Panama lived in fear under the thumb of a dictator. Today, democracy is restored. Panama is free. Well, I could say we invaded Panama because you Noriega. Know, I don't know how Americans can be so stupid to predict this. I mean, how can you be so stupid? The performance of the mainstream news media in the coverage of Panama has been just about total collaboration with the administration. Not a critical perspective, not a second thought. Our regret is that we were not able to use the media pool more effectively. You would think from the video clips that we had seen that this whole thing was just a Mardi Gras. That the people in Panama were just jumping up and down with glee. They focused on Noriega to the exclusion of what was happening to the Panamanian people, to the exclusion of the bodies in the street, to the exclusion of the number of dead. The Panama Deception, excuse me. I said the Panama Dispatch, but that was completely wrong. But, um... The movie, this is a documentary about the 1989 United States invasion of Panama. It recounts the events which led to the invasion, the death and destruction caused by the invasion and the aftermath. The film is very critical of the actions of the U.S. Armed Forces. It highlights media bias within the United States, showing events that were unreported or systematically misreported, including the downplaying of, civil, of civilian casualties. It also argued that the true purpose of the invasion was to prevent the then-scheduled retrocession of the Panama Canal Zone, to Panama, as agreed to in the Torrijos Ter Carter Treaties, uh, the film states that the U.S. government invaded Panama in order to destroy the defense forces, which were perceived as a threat to the U.S. control over Panama, and it sought a government which would be friendly to U.S. interests. Uh, the film includes footage of massive graves uncovered after the American troops had withdrawn, and footage of burned-down neighborhoods. Really refers to the use of experimental weapons and prevents depictions of some of the 20,000 refugees who fled the fighting. So. As you can tell, this is another one that I read off of Wikipedia because I really know nothing about this movie, and it seems like a movie that certain news outlets would probably immediately immediately try to say that this never happened, or I'm not going to say who because I'm not going to get into politic politics on this channel. But um, uh, it's narrated by Elizabeth Montgomery from I Dream It from Bewitch, so, so Samantha Stevens narrated it. That's pretty much all I got. To that's pretty much all I got for you, because really, like I said, I haven't seen this movie. I don't really have a need to see it, because really, it's not something that instantly piques my interest at the time. But um, it has an audience for some people, but I mean, for, that's pretty much all I got for you on this one, because really, I don't know what else to say about this one. It's one I haven't seen. Can't really talk about, can't really comment on it, because I haven't seen it. So, yeah, that's the Panama Deception for you. 
And so on that note, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. Next time we meet, we'll look at the movies of August 7th, 1992, including this year's Best Picture winner, which was Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven, John Lithgow and Lolita Davidovich in the thriller Raising Cain, uh, The Family Adventure Three Ninjas, we also have Whispers in the Dark, Mistress, London Kills Me, Bed and Breakfast, and also Drive. Not the Ryan Gosling Drive, but a different drive. So, eight movies to look at next time around, so... It'll be a packed one that, one that next one will be. So, With that said, though, thank you very much for watching. And if you want to see more videos like this, uh, please hit the playlist on the next page. Check out the previous episode. And I'll see you guys tomorrow for another episode. So thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. And until then, as always, take care.